first of all, thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, let's talk first of all about Cedars being a family tradition with the Brennans. Uh, tell me how the whole thing began. Well, actually, my grandfather started with Sears in 1898. Uh, he was one of a, a family of four, four children, and uh, the other two people were uh, school teachers, and one was a, a postman. And my grandfather went to work for Sears, and he had a big family; he had eight kids, and six of the eight kids ended up going to work for Sears, including my father. Uh, so we've had a, we've had a we've had a, a direct uh, connection with Sears from. 890, 1898 until almost the end of the century. Why was Sears such a good place to work in those days? Why did it attract uh, Why did it attract yeah. him and your father and the uncles? Good question. I, first of all, it was a growth company. Uh, secondly, it was a stable company. It had it offered wonderful benefits to its employees, including profit sharing, which was uh, instituted in uh, 1916. It was the first company, first major company in the country to share a part of the profits with the employees. And so people tended to come to work for Sears and they stayed with Sears for their entire career, as I did. I, I spent 39 years with Sears and, uh, and the, my father work, worked his whole career with Sears. Unfortunately, he died quite young, uh, but uh, he, he spent his career and I had uh, several uncles who, uh, who uh, also had their whole careers with Sears, including one that was with Sears when I was uh, heading the company. Sears, uh, in the days when your grandfather uh, started with the company, sold just about everything you could think of from stoves and clothes and everything, all the way up to houses. I mean, Carlinville, Illinois is full of Sears. Of Sears houses, right, right. Well, the, the idea was that Sears was the place you could buy anything. And in, in effect, in those days, we were a rural economy. In fact, we were just in the catalog business up until 1925. And what we did, what, what Richard Sears and Julius Rosenwald did, is brought to the smaller towns in America the ability to buy merchant, a wide assortment of merchandise at very competitive prices. Yeah, and, was, and, and you're right. You, this was a rural economy. You didn't have, you couldn't go to the store and buy all the stuff. You didn't right. have the critical mass to get all that down here. Right, right. Um, what drew you into the company? Well, uh, I, w I was attracted to retail as a very young man. I started with a company called Benson Rickson. They were in the clothing business here in Chicago. And I started with them when I was in high school, and coincidentally, they opened a store, or bought a store in Milwaukee. I went to Marquette to, to college, so I worked for them for four years while I was going to college. And then when I graduated, they offered me a job as a full-time assistant buyer which for a guy 21 years old was a, was a pretty good opportunity. But back in the back of my head, I thought I wanted to be in retailing and I wanted to be with the best. And uh, so on a kind of on a whim one day, I gave them a call and went over and had an interview and, and was hired. And it was hired as a salesman uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, selling men's furnishings. Now, what year was that? That was 1956. 1956. Retailing in America had undergone some dramatic changes at that point. Mm -hmm. We saw, uh, well, housing patterns, everything changed right after the war with the interstate highways. Right. How did, how did retailing change uh, start mushrooming in those days? Well, there, there were basically a few national firms, Montgomery Ward, J.C. Penney, Sears, Roebuck & Company. There was a chain of department stores uh, that still exist today called Federated. And, and, and there was a move from the city, from the core city, into the suburbs. And as a result of that, shopping centers were built. And Sears was a pioneer in the shopping center business. We, we actually were in the shopping center business. And so what we were simply looking for is following the growth patterns of the demographics of the time. And, uh, and there was an opportunity to build a huge number of stores. And so in those days, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, there was a, a, a huge expansion of retailing, uh, and all of us participated in it. And as part of that, the shopping center developed, and the specialty store concept with the big box stores, so to speak, uh, ended up being the core of a, a, a mall, a regional shopping center. Now, for a young man on his way up, uh, you started working your way up the positions uh, in management, managing stores and in chains of stores or districts. Exactly. Uh, you moved 
I believe your first assignment was, was in the South, is that correct? No, my first assignment uh, uh, was in Baltimore. Uh, I went to Baltimore to be a store manager. I ran two different stores in Baltimore. Uh, then I went to New York, to Buffalo, to Philadelphia, to Boston, uh, to Atlanta, and I finally ended up back in Chicago. Obviously, the uh, company uh, thought that uh, they had that you had something going for you, and you were you were moving up the ladder. Uh, you were in Chicago. What year was that? Well, when I when I, I left Chicago in 1967, I went out to be a store manager in Baltimore, and I ended up coming back to Chicago in 1980 as president of the company. So, a certain amount of luck you know, took place, and. And, uh, and, a, and a willingness to move and to do different things. And unfortunately, I had a family that was willing, uh, six children uh, and, my, and a wonderful wife who were willing to follow me from town to town. And, uh, and uh, we ended up back home. Now, in the, that was 1980? 1980, 1980, I came back as president, came correct. Back as president. Uh, the company was diversifying. It was doing a lot of different things. And a lot of other companies were doing that. You saw insurance companies buying into media properties and things like that. Mm -hmm. was, that was the 80s. How would you describe that decade for, for your company? Well, my predecessor, Ed Telling, who was a brilliant guy, had a vision of expanding into financial services. And, and he did it. We bought Coldwell Banker, Dean Witter. We had Allstate. We, uh, Allstate was a wholly owned subsidiary of Sears that we started uh, from scratch back in the 30s. And, and we had a big credit card business. So we were very deep in financial services. But essentially what happened is Ed Telling gave me the, the, the merchandise company to run. And while I was running the merchandise company, he went off and did this expansion. When did you become CEO? I became CEO in 1985. Uh, I was uh, uh, running the merchandise company up until that point. Uh, before I became CEO, I was made COO of the entire company. So but for about a year and a half, I ran the, 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 the businesses reporting to Ed Telling, but, but I was kind of running the things on a day in and day out basis. In 85, I became the president, chairman, and CEO. And how did, how did it come about that uh, a number of years later, I'm sure as business trends shifted and the market forces shifted, you decided to refocus the company back to its roots, back into retail. Mm -hmm. Tell right. us about that. Right. The, the, the essential issue was that uh, we were successful in diversifying. I mean, great companies, Colwell Banker, Dean Witter, Allstate. The problem was that we had a single stock, and the investor didn't want to buy a retail stock in order to get a financial services company. And so we, our, our stock was terribly undervalued. We never really got credit for the value that we had created. And so after a lot of reflection and, uh, and, and, and a lot of work with outside help, uh, investment bankers, for example, uh, we decided to, to break up the company. And, and we took uh, Allstate public, we did, took 20% of it public in an IPO. We took Dean Witter public 20% in an IPO. And then subsequently, over a three-year period, we spun the balance of Dean Witter and Allstate to the Sears shareholder. And, 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 and we created an enormous amount of value. And here in 2005, if you look back, uh, the market cap of the total company, uh, that is the price of the stock times the number of shares outstanding, uh, was about $10 billion. Today, Allstate alone is $40 billion. Morgan Stanley, which we subsequently merged uh, with, uh, Dean Witter merged with, with Morgan Stanley, has a market cap of $60 billion. And Sears has a market cap of 25 or $30 billion. So if you look at the, the value created, we went from about $10 billion to arguably about $100 billion in, in value. So the companies were solid. They've done incredibly well. It's just that the, the, the way the investor looked at what, where we were, uh, they didn't understand what they were buying. And ultimately, it all proved successful. It, it turned out okay. It turned, yeah. out, turned out very okay. Yeah. You also, uh, in going back and looking at some of the literature and remembering the marketing as it, it changed over the decades when, when you were in control, you always had an eye out for modernizing the company, making it uh, uh, a 
appeal to contemporary tastes. Can, can mm -hmm. you talk about that a little well, bit? Well, you know, basically, I'm a retailer under all of this. I've done a lot of things. I've been involved in a lot of things. I still am. But basically, I, you know, I started out selling merchandise, and, and, and I was a store manager. I love being a store manager. The store, running, a, running a big Sears store is one of the great satisfaction jobs that you could possibly imagine. And so I, I love the, the, the detail of the store. And we launched a program in the early 80s called the Store of the Future. It was, a, it was an attempt to take, you know, what arguably was a company that maybe had grown a little bit stale, and, and, and to look at each piece of the, of the company, each piece of the store, because all the company was was a thousand of the single stores that, that are the essence of the, of the business. And, and so we had a lot of fun doing that. We, we took three stores in three parts of the country, uh, in Texas, in Boston, and here in Chicago, and we took a third of the store and we worked on bringing it up to date, and then ultimately put together a single store and then, and over a period of years, we remodeled uh, all of our stores to, con to conform to the, the store of the future. When you would look into the, the Craftsman line, the tools area, the section there, it was all, uh, all the, all the, uh, all the logos looked right. Everything. Was the colors right. were matched. The there was a there was a commonality that said to the said to the customer, "You've come to the right place. This." This is where you can get what you want in this particular business, whether it be appliances, whether it be hardware, whether it be lawn and garden, whether it be apparel. You also went out and drew some star power in some of the in some of the little lines, like Cheryl Teagues came mm -hmm. and, and worked as a spokesperson. For the yeah, Cheryl Teagues, Arnold Palmer. Uh, Arnold was a was a terrific spokesperson for Sears. He still is a terrific spokesperson. For, for golf and for the country, one of, one of the most wonderful people I've ever worked with. But we had a whole group of people uh, that's, that, that, were, that were supporting us that way. And um, let's see, sort of reflect, if you will, on going from working as someone behind the counter, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at the local Sears store, becoming a, a manager of, 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 of a store, and then around the districts and then on up. Uh, mm -hmm. how, did, how did working behind the counter help you uh, in the positions you eventually had with the company? Well, basically, you know, what merchandising is is selling merchandise to people. And you have to know people. And you have to, you have to, have, you have, to have worked, I believe, you have to have worked face-to-face -face with people. And hopefully I've never changed. I mean, I'm still basically the guy I was in 1956 when I was selling long underwear to people to the farm community in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And, and uh, it's just kind of part of, part, part of my makeup. So I was just fortunate to be able to move from job to job, from level to level. And in those days, I was considered to be quite a young guy for the jobs that I had. So I almost always had people working for me who were considerably older than I was. And uh, and it worked out, you know. I, I I'm blessed, I think, to have had a had the the privilege of doing all those different jobs. You you, you joked a little earlier with uh, your your executive assistant about uh, having had two or three or four retirements so far. Right. Uh, when when you retired from Sears at, at the top, mm -hmm. uh, you must have been very proud of what you accomplished there. I, I I've always been proud of that. That 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 it. Because of my family heritage, uh, because I've been my family has been part of Sears almost from the beginning, uh, it, 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 it's it's a love that I've had that uh, it's hard to duplicate. But you go on to other things, and I have been fortunate to be able to do a lot of other things. I'm on I'm on six large corporate boards today, public company boards, which is very unusual. Uh, it's probably too many today, and hopefully my next retirement will be paring back a little bit of, of, of what I'm doing. I want to move on to one of those uh, areas. Uh, executive Chairman of AMR worked with American Airlines through some very difficult times. Yes. Uh, let's talk about that. How did you come to be with them? Well, I was on the, the American board for about 15 years, and uh, it's been a, it's a great company. It, it, there's a great similarity uh, with American and Sears. I mean, you're, you're dealing with the American public. And, uh, and, and, and you're, you're dealing with customers. 
the, 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 the family uh, approach within America, and the people are proud of the company. The employees represent the company very well. Tough industry. 9-11 happened. The industry was decimated, and we all had to, we all, we had to make huge adjustments. Uh, then, it, uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, when, when the costs were so high and the business wasn't so good and oil prices were beginning to go up, uh, we, we had to go to our employee groups and ask for some concessions. Uh, they gave us those concessions, but in the course of all of that, we kind of fell into a crisis kind of situation. So I was asked to be executive chairman, uh, and we appointed uh, Gerard Arpey as our CEO, and he and I worked as a team uh, over the course of about a year and a half to, uh, to try to stabilize the company. Uh, we were about that far from bankruptcy, not a secret. Everybody in the, in the industry knew that, and, and, uh, and, and, and that's a scary thing to go through. And so when you, ha you go through a scary time, you need stability. And, uh, and I guess I, you know, I was kind of part of, of, of that stabilization. I'm extremely proud of what's happened. We, we just finished the second quarter. We made money in the second quarter, first time since 2000. Uh, that we've had a, a, a profitable quarter. The company is stable. Uh, we have a, a strong cash position, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the planes are full today. Yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge uh, impact on the state of Illinois in particular. When mm -hmm. you, look at, you go out here to O'Hare and you see the American presence there. What does that mean to the state of Illinois to have that company up and healthy finally turning a profit? I think it's incredibly important. Our, our base is in Dallas-Fort Worth. That The company is headquartered in DFW. Uh, the second biggest market is Chicago. And uh, we, are, we are a very big player here. We, we, there, there are two airlines, of course, that are, that are the major uh, servers of, 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 of O'Hare. And O'Hare is a gateway to the world. And the world is what the future is. I mean, we're looking ahead today. Uh, at commerce between Asia and Europe and South America and the Middle East, unbelievable. And, and the link with all of that is the airline business. Uh, we're going to launch airline service nonstop Chicago-Shanghai in, 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 in the spring. And, and, and we're, going to, we're going to, in the late fall, uh, institute service to Delhi, nonstop service Chicago-Delhi. And so O'Hare is a linchpin uh, in the world economy, and we're a very important part of it. Ken, I know that you were active in the uh, in the expansion of O'Hare and all of the work that went on in that. We've been working on it for 15 years, and, and I think it's going to take place. I, I, I would say it is going to take place. In fact, uh, just uh, this week there was a, 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 a vote of support for the O'Hare expansion plan. We desperately need a couple of more runways at O'Hare. Uh, the problem is not the, the airport itself. The problem is when weather moves in. And when weather moves in, you have to stretch out the number of flights that are taking off and landing. And when that happens, there's delays that take place all over the world. Well, I know it backs up everywhere when, when right. that happens. Uh, I, need to, I need also to turn to uh, some of your work in the civic arena as mm -hmm. well. Uh, I know that uh, your, your long... Uh, Affiliation with Marquette continues to thrive, and of course, DePaul University. Let's mm -hmm. talk about let's talk about those two institutions first. Well, uh, I went on the board of each of them. It's very unusual to go on the board of two major universities that are only a hundred miles apart. I ended up as chairman of the board of Marquette. Uh, did that for four years, uh, and then subsequent to that, when my term ended, uh, I was asked to be chairman of the board of DePaul. So I have chaired two major universities and. Uh, and I've, I've had great satisfaction from that. It's a, it's a whole different world in some ways. In other respects, it's the same. And, uh, but you, you, you don't make decisions in quite the same manner uh, in, in, in a not-for-profit world as you do. In a corporate world, you make the decision and bang, you do it. In, in the, there's a little more reflection that takes place in, in the other world. Uh, I've also, for the last seven years, I'm in my seventh year as chairman of the board of uh, Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center. And, uh, and we were in a uh, kind of a turnaround situation there that, uh, uh, that uh, has happened, and, and, and we're, we're very pleased with that. Well, it, 
you, you mentioned that the uh, the healthcare industry and everything that's happened with that in the last 20 years, uh, the growth of uh, Medicaid spending, everything, it's, it's relative impacts have been uh, not easy running a, a healthcare organization no. in this kind of environment, especially one that serves such a diverse population here. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the underlying fact, though, is that healthcare is a growth industry. Uh, fortunately, we're all living longer. Uh, that we can be, we, we have problems that develop, but they can be fixed. I mean, it's a miracle what's happened in in our ability to help people live longer and fuller lives. And and so, anytime you're looking at an, at an institution or an industry, what you want is the ability to grow. And so, healthcare is a growth industry. It's fraught with problems. It's fraught with funding problems. It, it, Medicare, Medicaid is a big issue. Managed health care is a big issue. Uh, prescription drugs is an, is an issue. And, and so what you have to do is be very good at it. There is no way you can be a mediocre player today in the health care industry and survive. And, and so you have to have good people who run places very professionally, who are at the cutting edge of what's going on, and have an incredibly good medical staff. That's what we have at, at Rush. How does Rush fit into the local health care scene here in Chicago? Uh, the Chicago health care scene is, is pretty fragmented. Uh, for most cities, it's very, compared to most cities, it's very fragmented. Uh, you have five uh, academic medical centers in the metropolitan area. That's quite a few. Academic medical centers is where it all happens. It's where, where, where you educate new physicians. It's where you do research to help the future. Uh, and, and you apply that research in the hospital clinically, and that's what Rush is all about. Here we're, we're blessed in Chicago to have a number of institutions, and we all have a piece of the pie, and we're all competing with each other in a way, uh, and, uh, and, and what we're proud of at Rush is, is, is our medical staff. We, we, have, we have just an unbelievably good medical staff and an extremely strong nursing structure. Uh, we are a magnet nursing hospital, which is recognition for an outstanding nursing program. The only full-service hospital uh, in Chicago that has that uh, it has that designation. What would you have to say about the importance of civic involvement for a corporate executive such as yourself? Uh, you have the talents, you have the business uh, sense, you have the connections. Uh, to do an awful lot of good just with picking up the phone and making a call or two. You, you have to give back. I mean, it's, it's incredibly important when you're privileged to do all the things that, that many of the CEOs have been able to do. You have to give back. And we have a remarkable business community in Chicago. Uh, most of my associates, most of the people that I work with uh, are friends. We know each other. We help each other. Uh, whether it's Millennium Park or whether it's Rush or whether it's uh, the United Way. We, we work together and we try to find in our schedule uh, enough uh, time to devote to that uh, and, and there's great satisfaction from that. Chicago is a vibrant community. I mean, we arguably are one of the best cities in the, in, in the, in the world in which to live. Our, our quality of life here is extraordinary and a big piece of that quality of life is, is the result of the involvement of the business community. I know that you can draw a lot of satisfaction from the various uh, areas of your life and the involvement you've had. What gives you the biggest satisfaction as you, as you look back on things where you are now? Oh, my family. Uh, I have six children. Uh, I'm proud of every one of them. Uh, they're all doing night good things. Uh, they're all good people. They live around the world. My oldest son lives in Hong Kong, for example. Uh, we were gypsies when we were moving around, and so I've had the the, the, the opportunity to offer them the uh, the chance to see the other part of the world, and uh, and they've picked it up and run with it. Um, you've kind of hinted at maybe another retirement in the offing. What what's next for you? I'm not going to retire. <laughs> I will do something. You know, I may not do as much as I'm doing now. I like to work. I have a full-time office. Uh, I'm blessed with an assistant who is extraordinary. Uh, she has been at my side helping me for 25 years, and 
Lou Frizz and uh, and uh, I, I I worry though if if she ever decides to retire then I'm probably going to have to I'm probably going to have to follow her because I depend on her so much. So you you expect to keep your hand in at some point? I will. Yeah, as long as God willing, you know, as long as as long as I have good health and I have energy and uh, so far so good. Thank you so much. I think that went very well. Good. I think we're is there anything I didn't talk about? No, I think I think that they're very well done. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed very much uh, going down to uh, to SIU and, and and receiving the the Lincoln Laureate Award and met. There were four or five hundred people there, and every one of them came through the line. Every one of them, uh, I, I sat, I stood next to uh, Jackie Joyner Kersey, uh, and uh, who was a, a very popular choice, obviously, and is from the from that area, the East St. Louis area, and uh, and uh, she was a she was a charming she is a charming person, and so the two of us met a lot of people. It, it, you, you look at the people that, uh, for example, this year who won the award, uh, such a diverse group, and mm -hmm. all the stuff that they do is just amazing. It is it is amazing. Yeah, is it, just listening to the to the biographies as the presentations were made. Uh, was exciting. It, it was exciting to be part of it, and and uh, but it was to to, to see, the, the, as you say, the diversity of what people have done, and and all people that have their roots here in Illinois. Mm -hmm. It's just it's fascinating. It turns out that we couldn't stop.